Glenn Murphy, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Pleasure to be with you again, Howie. Good yeah. to see you, mate. Yeah, and I'm happy to be on Sistema for Life. Yeah, great. <laughs> Not for the first time. Nope. No. Yeah. Um, so we've, uh, we're in an interesting situation. We've got a, a pandemic or a hoax. <laughs> we've got, um, you know, racial justice protests or anarchy. We've mm -hmm. got um, people stuck at home. We've got a lot of fear. We've got a lot of um, uh, conflict mm -hmm. and um, I think what you know, we've, we've had conversations offline getting into the details. But what I would love to talk to you today about is healing and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a it's a wild and interesting time to be a stress or wellness coach. I think it's, it's, it's not all of the problems we wanted, but it seems like we've got a duty and a responsibility to, to rise to this. Yeah. So let's let's just start with your your take. Like where where are we and what is it doing to people? Um, obviously, um, we're in the midst of a lot of confusion. And um, for the most part, the overwhelming emotions seem to be anger, um, frustration and just kind of ongoing either confusion or people just kind of on purpose trying to seek some sort of certainty and in doing that pushing themselves towards one narrative or another. Um, and, you know, if we can get into the politics of of how that gets pushed and the ways in which people get pushed and pulled around. But I think other people have talked about that at length and we're all kind of fairly aware of how we're manipulated by politicians or by interest groups or by social media and stuff like that. Um, so that's not really what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is what's the way forward here? What's the way out? You know, if you're confused and angry and you're not sure how best to act, what you should acknowledge and to what extent um, and what should be driving your behavior. Um, people people want some some positive thing to do with all this emotion, right? It's not enough just to say, close your eyes, breathe and go to your happy place because all this shit's there again tomorrow, right? So <laughs> so it's not gonna it's not gonna last very long, even less time than it normally does, right? Normally you can maybe you can get away with a couple of days of that until something major happens. But in these times, something major ha seems to be happening every 20 minutes you know it's like the history is accelerating for some reason uh, in in 2020 um so so what i'm interested in really is like where do we go from here how do we how do we sort out what's real and what isn't real how do we best not only change behaviors in ourselves but encourage others to change behaviors in a way that would be helpful to solving the whole situation to healing ourselves and healing others um and and then what kinds of things do we really want to avoid do we know are going to be terrible ideas during this time. So that's what I'm focusing on right now. I'm trying to I'm the pragmatist, right? I'm trying, uh -huh. <laughs> trying to find a way through. Yeah, because, you know, I've um, I have been for the last probably several months, but certainly the last several weeks, I have been <clears throat> fueling myself with outrage. Yeah. And it feels really good. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of positive feedback. <laughs> On yeah. so specifically on social media for mm -hmm. outrage. Um, yeah. And I'm also a healer, right? Yeah. I'm all, which means that if, if somebody came to me um, and said, I would like healing, the first thing I would not do is jump down their throat about their views, their beliefs, even yeah. even their harmful actions. I would approach it with a much more compassionate eye. And yeah. like what, what, what I'm realizing is that I've um, I need to jump off the outrage train. And mm -hmm. at the same time, not, um, there's narratives I bought into that feel like jumping off the outrage train is a betrayal of yeah. the people on behalf of whom I have been feeling the outrage. Yeah. And, and, and you can see I've absolutely I've absolutely suffered from the same thing. I think I've vacillated between wanting to be kind of like a voice for reason and calm and like everybody just stay cool and calm down. And can't we all just get along? Right. But if you use that narrative in light of, say, you know, the the revelations of kind of systemic racism, depending on how far you want to kind of acknowledge 
that and the extent of it, then saying, hey, it's no problem, we should all just learn to get along is kind of denying the reality of people who don't have that option, right? <laughs> that, that are being persecuted and are on the on the bad end of this problem, right? It's not so easy to snap your fingers and say, hey, just forgive everybody, there's no real imbalance, there's no inequality here, it's okay, we can get along. Clearly that's not true, so it does feel like a betrayal. And the same thing is true of COVID to an extent. You know, it's like a, there's one part of me that says, which knows actually, you know, on a, on a biological level, that panic cannot and can never be the best response to this. And that just raging at people who don't wear masks and raging at people who want to get back to, you know, some semblance of being able to support themselves and their families and that kind of stuff, just raging at them wholesale is, is not going to help because it's it's not going to create the right environment for me to understand what's going on. And it's not going to help anybody else either. Right. So the panic can't be the place that we start from. Panic and anger can't be the place we start from. But again, I feel like if I take my foot off the gas on this and there's. I don't know at what point I decided my role in this was to try and be some sort of arbiter for information on the internet. It's ridiculous. There's billions of people and I have no influence, right? So, but, but in my own mind, if I don't speak up about um, my support, for example, for Black Lives Matter, or if I don't speak up for my support for um, you know, scientifically based um, recommendations for social distancing and things like that, that I'm somehow complicit um, in helping people to become more desperate, less healthy, and and perpetuating the problems, right? So it's this idea of kind of you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, right? Um, and this is where the, the shame and the guilt already starts to come into it. Yeah, like a, a, the, an example for me was when I, when I saw the video of Amy Cooper, the woman in New York who called the cops on the black man who was birding, when, yeah. you know, she was the one whose dog was off leash. Yeah. Um, so the narrative, which I think is a true one, is like she's playing a race card. She's playing a very dangerous game. She's yeah. knowingly using her privilege. Um, we know what, how that story often ends. And yet when yeah. I saw it for the first time, the thing that stood out for me was her trauma. Yeah. And and I immediately criticized myself for for seeing that mm. because like her, you know, like what about his trauma? What about the trauma of the victims? As a, sure. but, but when I see like, you know, I was down at a, at a rally um, in Pittsburgh before they took down the statue of the Confederate soldier and, the, you know, all mm. the right people were on one side and all the wrong people were on the other side. And, mm. um, you know, to see like to look at them in the face and see, OK, these are people largely obese. They, they definitely look diabetic, like mm poor, miserable, like I was almost like feeling ashamed for having empathy for people yeah. whom I see as on the wrong side of an issue. Yeah, and that that's a problem, isn't it? It really is a problem for all of us, because as soon as I think we give into that, then we shut down the possibility of conversation and reconciliation. No, even if we're not looking to even if we can't do anything as helpful as heal somebody else. If we want to move at all on an issue, if we want to have any kind of path forward, then we have to come to some sort of understanding. And even if we don't come to an agreement, right? Even if I don't agree with your views on Confederate statues or I don't agree with your views on masks wearing or something like that, right? We, at some point, we have to keep talking long enough for that to come to a useful resolution, right? Even if it's one that neither party is quite happy with, but at least gets most people to do the right thing or something like that, you know? Um, and if we, if we completely deny that instinct toward empathy, which I think we have, I think we have to fight to push that down and replace it with something else. I don't I don't think fear is the strongest um, mm. motivator that we have. I, I think we're deeply social animals and we want to engage with other people first. Um, and if that engagement fails, then we default to fear or fighting or other stuff like that. Right. It's that engagement is critical on the front end. Um, but what we're seeing is that I, I think there's a the situation is making it difficult to do that, right? It's 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 very, very easy to just become polarized and jump into one group or another. And not because you want to demonize the other side, but because you want to mark yourself out as one of the good guys and, and to not take a stand and to not um, to not unequivocally just support the people on who you initially viewed as being on the right end of this argument is to betray the entire issue. And, and that's difficult because sometimes the issues can change, right? Sometimes you can watch a video on YouTube and it looks like 
some cop has brutalized somebody, right? Um, and sometimes that's it's as simple as that. There was it was a, it was a bad cop, and he brutalized somebody, and he should be held accountable and all that kind of thing. And then sometimes you see the full YouTube clip, and you realize there's a different context to it, right? And he was surrounded, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other things happened first, and he was defending himself. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of proportion of clips would be yeah. would be shown in kind of a, of a greater context like that. But the problem is that maybe let's say like 99 percent of the videos are just as they they look exactly as they are it's, it looks like brutality and it turns out to be brutality and racism but let's say like one percent of the videos you're watching one and you see something in it that makes you go wait a minute that's that's not quite right he's not doing what it what everybody's saying he's doing and if you don't allow yourself that possibility for empathy with the assumed perpetrator then you just shut yourself off to any other narrative at all and i think that makes not only does it stop that conversation, but it also makes you very vulnerable to being misled, right? Um, very vulnerable to being pushed further down the outrage train by whichever side it is. And even if it's a good intention side, that can still lead to some bad places sometimes, I think. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Zimbardo's, I think, Experiments, or mm. no, no, somebody else. Um, not the prison not, not the prison not, not milgram not zimbardo uh, yeah it'll come to me at some later point and i'll put it in the show notes if you don't remember uh, <laughs> the experiments where one person they were all being asked questions about very mm. obvious things like which line is longer or what color is this and all the confederates of the experimenter gave the wrong answer and then it came around to the actual subject and mm. like 70 percent of the time the person gave a clearly wrong answer to fit mm. in Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a powerful, there's a powerful um, group bias in that, right? And a, a kind of group selection bias where it's more important emotionally for us to fit in as social animals than it is for us to be correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and so what I'm feeling is like, I feel, I definitely feel there's parts of my being that are good and right and strong and courageous in taking the stands that I'm taking. And mm. it's also mixed up with a lifelong pattern of people pleasing, of yeah. losing myself in order to be approved of, like things mm -hmm. that go back to my earliest memories of childhood. So that part, yeah. part of my goodness in the world is entwined with an individual pathology. Yeah. Yeah, that's um that's that's a difficult insight to have. That's something for for a lot of people, I think. Um and I think it's it's easy to kind of point the finger and sort of say, yeah, that's you. And maybe you had a, a, a childhood full of pathologies. Mine was great. I'm pretty stable and I haven't got <laughs> anything like that. But but in reality, if like neuroscience has taught us anything and psychology has taught us anything, is that we're all kind of a patchwork of our past experiences, um, positive and negative. And, and we're continually kind of adding to that narrative and spinning little yarns to reassure ourselves like, as whole people. Um, and and if we don't see that, then it's going to be difficult to kind of get out of those narratives. I think that's yeah, it's a, it's a really tricky thing. And, it, and it's also tied up with the ways in which, of course, I mean, in obvious ways in which our parents or like authority figures responded to certain things as we grew up. Right. I mean, an obvious one would be if you had, you know, like a parent or a grandparent that was a, a thinly veiled racist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were just kind of saying racist things. They, they weren't overtly like abusing. Um, people of color or something like that, but they're just using racist terms flippantly and just kind of generally stereotyping about um, black people being lazy or something like that. Do you know what I mean? It's it's easy again that people pleasing thing of just wanting to be, um, you know, part of the gang, right. um, and pleasing your dad or your granddad and going along with that, even though there's some part of you on the inside which is like, yeah, I don't quite think that. I know a couple of black guys and they seem pretty cool and they're not lazy at all. And this is at odds. <laughs> there's some dissonance here, but I'm just going to go with this for the time being. And then that can become a habit which is reinforced later on mm -hmm. in the societal groups that you move through to the extent that you never really call anything out when you see it and you just make a habit of pleasing the people around you and going on with whatever they say and obviously that has repercussions on a larger scale i mean i was really actually um i was really moved by your recent plant yourself podcast with your uh friend and business partner josh lajoni and his brother dustin is it yeah, his brother right yeah on the previous episode for those who haven't heard it um which i thought was excellent in, in that they grew up in um was it louisiana they're in yeah. North, southern louisiana yeah, yeah. And uh, and a kind of like, you know, standard redneck Cajun hunting, fishing, F-150 truck driving boys, you know, <laughs> and they have these wide kind of country accents and all that kind of stuff. And they used to be like 400 pounds, eat all the meat, do all the things, you know, and that kind of stuff. And and they, they've talked a lot about their journey from, you know, 
um, from obesity and bad habits into, you know, um, into better health and more compassion just generally in their lives and the way that they treat themselves and others, right? And how that kind of led into an understanding that, you know, some of the racism and things that were surrounding them growing up were not okay, that they were a part of it and they had to change themselves and their, their ideas. And there was something deeply moving about listening to two guys not who were like intellectuals pontificating about racism on some kind of objective level, you know, <laughs> reading through like a history of things or, or even of like a, a super intellectual black author who's um, speaking about things that we need to be hearing about and listening to. It was like, OK, yeah, you understand. And the super intellectual professor of African-American studies, even though he's white, he might understand, too. So he's worth listening to. But listening to two kind of rednecks <laughs> talking about their conversion conversion story was um, <sighs> was deeply moving to me. I was just like, well, if these guys can find a way to, to see through this kind of thing, then there's got to be hope for all of us to, to have that deeper self-understanding that leads to to the kinds of behavior changes that, that they achieved. And there's no doubt that they're, they're living in a better place now, right? That they're right. happier for those changes. Right. Right? right. So I think that's the key is that it's about, you know, when we increase our self understanding, we can be more effective. Because what I've seen, like, I know a lot of people in sort of the healing and recovery community, um, which I consider myself to be a part of, not that I had a an addiction that anyone could, you know, could pinpoint and say bad, like my addictions were mostly socially acceptable or, or celebrated. Sure. Um, but like when when Mia, when my wife says something that hurts my feelings and I go into a rage, it's easy mm. for me to step back from that and say, oh, that would that triggered an implicit memory of when I was a small boy and my mother couldn't gaze at me properly because she was a Holocaust survivor and she was stressed out and like, mm. oh, that was the fear of abandonment. Let me um, mm. let me work on that. Whereas it's much more seductive to have the same response of rage to a social justice issue that's out there and mm. never question if there's anything other than, you know, pure goodness in me that makes me want to you know, scream and, and shout. So, so what's the difference in those two situations? You think you think it's just that in the one you can identify, you know, Mia as one individual doing one thing and to maintain your anger at her, you have to kind of find a reason. Right, right? And, it, uh, and you have to kind of outsource the blame to her for making you angry and all that kind of stuff. But when it's one to many, when it's a whole bunch of people talking about an issue, whether it's people campaigning for to wear masks or people campaigning to you know, pull down Confederate statues or whatever it's going to be, right? It, is it harder to maintain that idea that it might be you in that instance, where it's easier to outsource it to a whole bunch of bad people than it is to one? Yeah, I, th I, th I think the problem is that, I mean, you know, I feel I'm guilty, right? Like I feel like I haven't done enough. Yeah, um, I'm, you know, I, I keep going. I'm very good at like remembering every bad thing I ever did. Yeah. Right. Like I, I can remember like when I wrote the, the essay in 10th grade that sort of insulted mm. my teacher and I can still like feel flushed with shame for like, you know, like the low the, the low lights reel of my life plays in front yeah. of my eyes on a regular basis. And so sure. like when it's a social justice issue, I think there is a justification. Like it's clearer to me that there's a right and a wrong side yeah. and um, and that I haven't always been stepping up on the right side. And so it almost feels like, well, now that's got to end. Yeah. And and yet the the I'm not helpful. Right. I'm talking to the same people on Facebook who follow me, the people who, you know, the, there are people who have um, the unsubscribed from Plant Yourself because they didn't like that episode. So I'm never going to talk to them again. Even some people who liked it wrote to me and said, you know, I think you're not coming from a place of love here. And I was like, fuck you. I'll show right. you yeah. she wrote, what we should love. We should have loved Hitler. Like I, I could feel sure. all, all the arguments. And yet yeah. there's a point that I don't know how, you know, useful I am in the echo chamber. And it does feel very shame and guilt driven. Yeah. So uh, so let's, um, let's have a look at that at the moment and just just sort of see, is there ever because it's often said that um, you know, guilt and shame are useless emotions and you just shouldn't have them. My brother mm -hmm. famously lived his whole life this way. He's like, he would say this. He's like, I don't do guilt. 
And so, and he wouldn't pay lip service to it. He wouldn't just suppress it and claim that he didn't feel guilty about things. Like he made a point of not feeling shame or guilt. He's like, I made a decision, and if it was a bad one, I have to live with those consequences, and I have to make it up to people or learn from it and make better decisions in the future. But I'm not going to continue to feel bad about that decision. He mm -hmm. like he just trained himself, I think, to do that. And in some ways, that made him a much happier person <laughs> than some of the some of the rest of us, you know. But there's there is a there is a function to guilt and shame. Do you know what well, I, I know about? guilt specifically but definitely in the emotion of shame right it, shame elicits the same responses um in terms of the nervous system as fear does right almost the same responses there's there's some slight changes in kind of the the color of it you know and the, and the, mm. the way that we experience it of course and even people have tried to map out subjectively how shame feels different in terms of temperature balance in the body right like that um, fear feels like kind of like a, a deep rising in the stomach or something like that. And mm. shame feels like a coldness in the chest, right? Where you're going colder and things like that. So there's, there's some really interesting experiments that have tried to tease apart the subjective sensations, those two things. But on a neurological level, both of these are um, processed by the limbic system, right? Um, and in structures either in the in around the the amygdala i think the insula specifically in the, within the limbic system is the structure that's most closely related to shame and in people for example who have, have like traumatic childhoods who are repeatedly shamed in kind of like a toxic way where they're just told they're bad kids and they'll never amount to anything and they're awful and they're dirty or something like that um neurologically like when you scan their brains later in life they have this enlarged insula this one structure and then interestingly it starts to wither faster and it starts to degrade faster with age and, sh and shrink and lead to other kinds of problems when they get older um but the, the important thing to realize about this is that it's there for a reason right and and the, like a, a stark example might be if my kid cora um she's like three years old and she's very very prone to just running into danger right <laughs> she's just like she's fearless unfortunately the other one is very very cautious cora's fearless and just runs jumps off of things and then worries about there's going to be something to land on afterwards right <laughs> um and and she's when we go out for a walk in our neighborhood right and um, she's constantly just like running into the street and back out again and like some suv is coming down the road and we're like cora cora right we have we try and do it like quietly at first so it's not to startle her or something but then at, there comes a point where you're like yeah this is not the time for a like a slow let's connect with the child and redirect mm -hmm. and then you know there's a time when you just have to shout at them to free or move right because you haven't got that kind of time um and in that instance it can feel terrible sometimes when you shout no at a kid when they're running out to the road they freeze and in terror the sympathetic nervous system fires up they feel genuine terror and then they start crying right they're, they're just like <gasps> you shouted at me and i didn't know what was i didn't know what there was to be scared of and it seemed terrible and sometimes you think i overreacted maybe that was too much i didn't have to make her cry but there's a function to that right when she freezes that way and the sympathetic nervous system is activated, right? Um, she actually stores that memory so that next time you shout no, she will just freeze. She'll stop physically, and it's way less likely that she'll run into a road, jump into a pool, electrocute herself, or any number of other things that Cora tries to do every week, right? right. <laughs> this way, or right? or so, she'll, she'll associate the street with that shame, and you won't even have to shout no. Maybe, yeah, yeah, at some point, but but definitely... In the short term, at least, she starts to associate that loud noise and the no with I should freeze, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's a response, right? It's designed to create a like stop what you're doing um, mm -hmm. for your own good type response. And that can be helpful. The, the key in this is that if you do that to a child and then they burst out crying and then you continue shouting like, I told you to do that. You're an idiot. You should have stopped, right? And then you walk away and you don't help them deal with their fear and their um their sympathetic arousal, right? Then basically they're just kind of left, kind of left with like a twitchy, hyper aroused um, sympathetic nervous system, and they don't figure out how to calm themselves down after something like that. And then they get into this what's been called like um, kind of like a a dance of arousal and fear. Eventually, right? They'll come across situations where. Uh, somebody will shame them or somebody will be like, no, you shouldn't have done that. It might be a boss. It might be a partner or something later in life. And and they're sympathetically aroused. They get the fear. They're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But then they don't know how to calm themselves down. And then that leads one of a couple of ways. Either they kind of hide in plain sight and they'll stop looking at people. They'll try and shrink physically and make themselves invisible. Or they'll react with aggression right back at the person who shamed them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how dare you say that to me? That scared me. You have no right to scare me and abuse me verbally that way. Right. And this becomes important on this scale, because if you're using if you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling shame about something because you've read about a few things or something like that. And, and you're like, OK, well, there's there's something that needs to be acted on here. 
then it might be useful in some ways, right? When you read something, it might be like a cold, hard slap in the face from like a, from somebody, from, from a scientist. For example, I've read um, or talked to friends who work in emergency rooms under COVID, right? Um, and if you ever start to think that COVID is just like the flu and it's no, you know, it's no worse, just talk to somebody who's had to work in an emergency room trying to keep 20 people alive on ventilators like they're playing a, a horrendous game of whack-a-mole, you know, like where they basically just have to kind of keep going between them, attempting to keep these people alive for a little bit longer. And it's terrible in the, the way that it affects the body. So, yeah, it, it's it's not enormously dangerous to a, to a vast amount of people in the country who are otherwise healthy, right? although we don't know all of the ins and outs of it. But if you do get it, it is not the flu. It is not the flu at all, right? If you suffer right. from symptoms, it's a completely different. It's, it's 20 times deadlier than the flu in that sense, right? Um, so for me, like if ever I started to think, eh, you know, there might be like some herd immunity and maybe we let this thing play out and it enters the cyclic thing of flu se you know, season and all that kind of stuff. All I have to do is read one of those or talk to one of my friends who is actually a doctor working on the front lines. And it's like smack. It's a smack in the face. And it's like, okay, yeah, I shouldn't be thinking that way. I should stop and think about the ways that I'm kind of running on and it's no good. But on the flip side, if somebody tries to create that emotion of shame in you, if they try and shame you for not being anti-racist enough, if they try and shame you for not wearing a mask everywhere with your family at every second, if they shame you for intoning that you might want to go back to work at some point and not take handouts from the government, do you know what I mean? Or that kind of thing, then it creates, it, it's a different thing. And you can get into that same response. You'll either go, oh, well, there's hopeless then that I shouldn't do anything. And you just kind of shrink into yourself and start to feel that there's no way out of this situation. Or, and this is critical, you start to turn your aggression back on the shamer. Mm -hmm. So the person who told you that you need to be, you know, more active in anti-racism, you're like, wait, I'm not racist. What, how dare you? Right. And we can't equate those two things. So it's not just that equivalency bias of people can't be told they're bad people. Racists are bad people. Ergo, I can't be racist. Right. It's not just that. It's also just on a neurological level. When you try to shame me. I have one of a couple of responses to that. And usually it's not going to be free, but it's going to be you. Right? It's going to be how dare you try and shame me, right? So that's the problem. It's um, it's um, That tactic can and, and will never work. And uh, I've had to learn this, I think, the hard way, and I'm still learning it. You know, that I've, I've put, again, put things on the internet or responded to people's comments when I've when they've said something or shared something that I felt is irresponsible in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly with in relation to COVID and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes sometimes I feel like it was coming from a good place, like that there's a there's a needed correction here because people will read this and it's better that I just park this evidence on the page and let people read it. But sometimes my comments weren't offered in that spirit. right? right. <laughs> They're offered in the spirit of outrage and like, how dare you suggest that I'm needed or I don't care about, you know, people going back to work or stuff like that. Right. So I felt like, again, justice was on my side and therefore I had to shame them. And then they would see the error of their ways and they'll go the other way. Not seeing in that instant that that's just about the worst tactic that I could use in order to try and get my message across. The message might be right. The tactic was horribly wrong. Yeah. And for me, the the impulse to shame others, I feel my own shame driving it. Mm. Right. Like um, and, and, you know, even. I feel shame. So I, I posted this podcast that you mentioned with the, with Josh and Dustin on YouTube. Yeah. I started getting comments. <clears throat> I got some I got a couple of comments that were very, very negative. I saw them as bigoted, hateful, ignorant, mm -hmm. and they still I could still feel shame like somebody doesn't like me. Like mm -hmm. I turned that around into, well, good. I don't want yeah. that person to like me, you sure. know, but but actually in my body, reading anything negative about me yeah. creates this impulse. And I think, you know, what what I've done, I think what a lot of people do is that we insource shame. Mm. Yeah. Right? So I was um, I was listening to uh, Dr. Gabor Mate talking about the physiology of shame that when a mother and an infant are having eye contact, the infant will break off the eye contact to avoid overstimulation and the infant is fine. If the mother breaks off eye contact, the infant will go into a shame response since mm. he sees it as a as a uh, a reaction, a physical reaction to loss of attunement. Sure. All right. Yeah. Loss of reassurance. It's like, yeah, like we need, you know, we need to, as you said, we like empathy is the strongest human emotion possibly. We need other people. And especially yeah. when our circuits are being laid down when we're babies, we absolutely not not metaphorically, we absolutely need other people. Um, yeah. so, so I've always thought of guilt and shame like touching the hot stove. 
right? Mm. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a thing that you do for a second for an instant that mm. allows you to, you know, it's, it's inhibitory. It allows yeah. you to stop and learn something and take d a different action. Um, mm. But I find, for, you know, for, for in me and in lots of people, it just becomes cyclical and it ends up perpetuating negative behaviors rather than solving them. Yeah, absolutely. So so this brings us to the question of like, what do we do about this? Right. If we, even if we have this insight and this awareness of societies about oh. social media. So we just we just glitched for like we're still glitching. OK, uh, yeah. Um, so can you can you go back to like, so what do we do about it? There have been a few little glitches, sure. but that was a longer one. OK, gotcha. So this brings us to the question of what do we do about all this? Right. So even given that we have this knowledge and insight about our own bodies and our own brains and our own tendencies to react to people. Right. It's, it's kind of a little bit like meditators who sit for long periods and gain key insights about themselves and then go home and immediately shout at the wife and kick the dog. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just like just because you know something, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to act on it. It's particularly if the same pressures are holding true. Right. And Lord knows the, the pressures are all holding true. They're not going anywhere. Right. It's not like to whatever extent you believe systemic racism exists, it's not going to suddenly evaporate one way or the other tomorrow. And COVID is not going to clear itself up in some magical puff of smoke, no matter what anybody in the administration is telling you, right? It's not going away anytime soon. And the economic problems that have been created by this aren't going anywhere, going away anytime soon. And we haven't talked about climate change. That's another, that's another one that I bracket in with this kind of, this, this dissonance of kind of knowing that you should be doing something, not quite knowing to the extent that you should acknowledge what's being told and the extent to which you should change your behavior. And then if somebody shames you into changing your behavior, like you should be composting all your food. It's so terrible that you use any plastic at all, right? You end up just being like, well, I can't be a terrible person. So screw you for trying to shame me. And now I'm going to buy plastic right. bottles and do right. things right. Yeah, so I, it amounts to the same kind of thing. Yeah. And around that, like I see that a lot in the plant based and vegan community, um, mm -hmm. which I think is with, with this sort of any community of of purpose where there's a mission to it, <clears throat> that there is to the extent that we and as individuals are not completely enlightened, we yeah. can posture with each other. So yeah. like who's more vegan? Um, mm -hmm. You know, some there's there's discussions where the plant based people who are doing it for health and the vegan people who are doing it for the animals can can really savage each other. <laughs> So you get into this kind of intersectionality of veganism, right? It's just like, well, I've, you know, I'm tw 12 levels down the virtuous scale to you. So I have a right to criticize everything you're saying. kind of thing. Right, right. What, you're yeah. not a breatharian yet? You still rely on, on carbon? <laughs> <laughs> Is that actually a thing? Breatharian? <laughs> I've heard it. Yeah, I've heard of it. I don't, I don't know that anyone's not, uh, you know, sneaking Snickers bars at 2 a.m. But, uh, you know, but certainly like there's a hierarchy like, you know, vegan, whole food, you know, vegetarian, vegan, whole food, plant based, raw, yeah. high raw. OK, yeah, uh, yeah. organic, high raw, organic, yeah. high raw, um, intermittent fasting, eat one meal every three days. Sure. Right. And, you know, around with climate change, too, like there was a period in my life where I was just taking cold showers. And yeah. the, you know, arguably the impact on climate was minimal, but the impact on me and the people around me was large in a negative mm. way because I was, you know, I was kind of toxic, both in my mm. superiority and in missing a pleasure. Yeah. And, you, and I guess there are corollaries to that as well with with COVID, right? And degrees of self-isolation and mask wearing and stuff like that, right? And the complication with that is, is that it's a great deal easier for some people to self quarantine to isolate, and to follow a lot of these measures than it is for others. That's the flat truth of it. Like some people before this were working two to three people facing jobs, right? And and earning a minimum wage on all of them before this started. And so the suggestion that they can't go back to work, that they can't, um, interact with people at any kind of level, right? And that there's not really much hope on the horizon. We just have to wait for a vaccine and wait for the government to sort it out, right? Putting a lot of trust in a system that doesn't seem to be working too well at the moment in the States anyway. Um, that suggestion is quite cruel, where, whether for, for some people whose lives haven't changed very much, who just were remote workers anyway, they were just kind of 
they work from home in like a you know a job which works with numbers or you know websites or something like that right their, their lives haven't changed appreciably appreciably they're still getting the money transfers they're still delivering their work via email or via spreadsheet or cloud based stuff whatever it is right and their, their lives haven't changed especially if they're living in a fairly nice situation and they can order out for groceries and amazon stuff and things like that it's like they're like what's the problem everybody should be able to self-isolate and self-quarantine it's mm -hmm. not a big deal um and even like i've seen the difference between people who have kids and people who don't have kids right people who don't have kids it's like yeah me and the wife will stay in and this is great because we hardly get enough time to spend together like this and now we can work we can put things away and we have all this time people with kids are like all of my time attempting to, to juggle the responsibility of homeschooling my kids, making sure that their, their, need, their needs are seen, making sure that they get some sort of social interaction for them so that they have some and attempting to work while all of this is happening and keep, you know, keep the income coming in to support all of these things. And they're very different sets of motivators. And at some point we just we default to the strongest motivator we have, right? We get to that hierarchy of needs thing. And we, if you get low enough, if you've got no income coming in, somebody's about to repossess your house. This is not happening in a widespread way yet, but it could, right? If the situation mm -hmm. panned out indefinitely. Once you get down to a certain precipice, a certain threshold, um, people will be, people won't care. And, and I think we see this all, even in the Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter movement and that kind of stuff, right? It's like before you know, public assemblies, you had people that were decrying people who were assembling to protest um, the COVID mask bans and things. And like, oh, look at these terrible people who are you know, standing around with AR-15s and protesting the government. They're such idiots, they're gonna infect other people, that kind of stuff. And then as soon as there is a important enough cause to warrant it, even if people weren't isolating and weren't distancing themselves and weren't wearing masks, it's like, it doesn't matter. That's way more, more important than not spreading the virus. And that is, it's difficult because it's, there's some hypocrisy there, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that it's not justified and I'm not saying that stuff, but it, it, it presents a double standard, which is not easy to resolve. And, and the real resolution, resolution is, is just that we're all always subject to these double standards. We, we have a shifting set of motivations and priorities depending on what's imminent and what's urgent and what we feel like we need for survival and health. If those needs get met, then maybe we can start to think about the larger needs of society and humanity and existential risks to the planet and our entire country mm -hmm. later on. But most people don't think in those terms most of the time, and you can't blame them for that either because that's the programming we have, and that's that's mm -hmm. kept us alive a very, very long time as individuals and species. Right. So um, we, uh, I have felt, uh, without articulating it, in the, my, my behavior over the last several months has implied that the way to win, the way to solve these problems is to fight something or fight mm. somebody. And, and, it, and it's clear as soon as I say it, that I don't believe that that's true. Yeah. And so, you know, you are a scientist, you're an expert on the physiology uh, and management of stress, and you're yeah. a martial arts instructor. So mm -hmm. if I want to get out of fight, <laughs> Um, yeah, what can I like? Like, I truly believe that the way through is love, that we're not going to solve any of these problems mm. without love. Um, yeah, right. Because people need safety in order to get out of fight or flight. And right. Like I could go through the whole thing, but it just it just seems very clear to me. How do we work on ourselves? Because I could just see mm. myself turning into a love warrior, berating everyone mm. who's not acting out of love. Sure. Yeah. Uh, how, what, what, are, what are the moves for, for ourselves as individuals to begin to reduce the shame, the guilt, the fight or flight, the anger, the hostility, the, the schismatism and yeah. and and find inner peace so that we can make the world a better place? So simple then, really, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I've got a, a, a pithy answer for that one. I yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, in like I said, there aren't any easy answers, but it's clear that if somebody's just telling you that the thing that you need to do right now is calm down, don't panic and stop feeling shame, it's not going to happen in the slap of, a, of, of your fingers, right? It's just not because of all the things we've already talked about. There, there are pressures and our bodies feel these things from the neck down and we process them for historical reasons, for reasons associated with our upbringing and reasons that are valid in the perceptions of our Right, assessment. It's a very complex situation. So I think the first is, and your analogy to a fight is is correct, right? If you want to win a fight, in at least in the, the way that I've been trained and most of the 
best martial artists that I know have been trained. The goal is not to wade in and be as aggressive as possible first, right? To come out blazing and just smash as hard and fast as you can and just be inhuman, right? That will only win you fights against people who aren't very smart and never had any opportunity to um, figure out anything themselves about how to defend themselves, right? More often than not, you just expend all of your energy, you're exhausted, you're angry, and you've made the other person angrier, and now they feel even more emboldened to fight you, right? Mm -hmm. So you can probably draw your own kind of psychological corollary there between the, how that works out in argument. So the first step, actually, in, a, in, in winning, not winning a fight, but resolving a fight, let's put it that way, in resolving a situation, a conflict that's going to come up, whether it's physical or argumentative, is observing and allowing. It's literally acknowledging what's going on here. Right, that initial step of denial, like how dare you, how dare this situation be like this, poor me, why is this happening to me, all of those things, right? None of them are helpful. The first thing you have to do is just try to see, accept everything that's happening, right? So whether that means accepting that not everybody's playing by the same rules right now, that not everybody sees your point, accepting maybe that you don't have, have all the information to listen to about how to be a good anti-racist. You don't know the concrete answers as to what's the best way to be somebody who's not super spreading COVID, right? The, the science shifts and the recommendations shift over time. You don't have all the answers. You're functioning in uncertainty and you're trying to make the best of a really crappy situation, which is unfolding right in front of you, right? There's uncertainty there. You don't want to be there. And the first step is being like, yeah, that's exactly where I am right now. So you stop, mm -hmm. you take a breath and you acknowledge all of those things. You acknowledge your part in it. You're in getting to this place and getting to this conflict and you acknowledge the other person's humanity, right? And their empathy and what might be driving them towards it. Like the lady in, um, who called on the birder, like you were saying, right? You try and accept the situation for what it is, first and foremost, right? Second, then you can say, all right, now I have to manage my panic because panic is not going to help. If I just freak out about all of these things coming in, if I start keep thinking about them in a ruminative circular way, it's not going to help me make any choices or decisions that are going to benefit me or the other person. So once you've accepted the fact that there's a conflict there, then you, so, you start to calm yourself down. And there's lots of techniques, there's breath work, there's, you know, um, specific um, ways of accessing your nervous system, lowering your blood pressure. We kind of talked about these in other podcasts, but we can redirect you towards my stress proof course and stuff like that if you want to, to learn more about that. Um, and I'm sure you have your own kind of methodologies that you recommend. Um, but drawing yourself out of that panic yeah, that, and recognizing that- I just, that, I just steal them from you. Yeah, so, exactly. so I'd rather send people to the source. There we go. Repurposing it will find its way back. Um, and that, so you don't, at that point you can be like, okay, I've acknowledged everything. I don't want to feel the panic and the terror and nor do I want to feel the shame and the valence of those is kind of similar, right? And so trying to feel and let go of those things first of all, right? Um, and deal with the situation that's right in front of you, right? So that might help you deal with an individual instance, right? An argument with somebody, a potential argument with a family member um, or a potential response you're about to tap out to flame somebody online or something, but it won't help you in the long term. I, I honestly believe the most important thing we can do right now is alternate consciously between periods of work and learning and periods of rest and contemplation. I think that's the, the most important thing we can do. I think if we just check out and try and rest all the time and just kind of you know, self-regulate and then we don't do any work, we run the risk of not being helpful in this situation, of not doing things, not learning enough in order to be helpful in combating the problems that are there, the issues, not the people, but the, the net issues, right? So we do need to do the work, but we don't have to do it 24 hours a day we don't have to feel guilty for not doing it 24 hours a day. We actually have a responsibility to ourselves to spend good amounts of time resting, contemplating, calming down so that we can go back to these issues in a useful way that doesn't breed conflict. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 I think, an iterative pattern of work, do the work, rest, contemplate, recover. I think it's essential now. And I think people are going one of two ways. They're either vegging out and doing all the rest right, mm -hmm. on Netflix and not engaging with anything and shutting down, or they're doing all the work. And they're doing it to such an extent that they're getting angry, they're getting, they're feeling ashamed, and they're shouting at each other on Facebook or, you know, almost coming to blows over the whole thing. So I think that's, it might sound simple, but I think that, that path, that iterating wave of activity is probably the most people, most important thing people can commit to right now. Yeah. Mm. So you have a couple of thoughts on that. One is that for me, doing the work of shouting on Facebook isn't actually work. <laughs> like it's, sure. it's not, um, like the, the amount sure. of, of work, like when I like, you know, I think one of the issues that especially people who are new to the topic 
face is like, what what is the work? Right, what yeah. what do I do? Um, mm -hmm. right, well, I, mean, I think that comes into that comes into acknowledging facts, right? So if you in the first phase of that, if you acknowledge that you don't know enough to do the work, then your first step should not be wade onto the internet and start arguing with people with the limited amount of information you have. It should be go right to the source of whatever facts you think might be available and then get them as highly corroborated as they are. There's, unfortunately, there's, there's a tendency at the moment, especially in America, to live in this kind of alternative post-fact world where whoever has the strongest opinion is uh, the dominance of opinion wins out in a kind of meme war or something like that, right? But it's really important, I think more than ever now, to go to the sources of facts and sort of say, what do we actually know about COVID and how to spread it and how not mm. to spread it? What do we actually know about the extent of racism in America, right? Not what um, this, this guy says is not happening and nor should it be what this one guy says is happening, right? You, we talked briefly about um, Robin D'Angelo and her book, White Fragility, which is super popular right now. And, you know, and it's basically mm. all about shaming white people into understanding the systemic racism and, if we, and we're not doing enough to combat it. Right. But the problem with that approach is, is that it, it doesn't it, it doesn't separate anything out from racism at all. Like everything is potentially racist. Right. Um, and then, again, also the, the approach is it leaves you with very little to do we, except accept the original sin of being born white and having to deal with that every day and atone for our sins. Right. So I'm not saying that there, there's not value in reading that, but there's probably a great deal of value in reading other things by black authors and <laughs> other things by other white authors who are like, this might not be the best approach to, to understanding the problem. And there might be limits to systemic racism within the police. And there might be limits to systemic racism within our governmental system. And some of these might be being, mistaken for racism when they're actually just power struggles or it's just straight inequality or haves and have nots you know it's like not everything points to the same to the same source sometimes and it's important to read as much as we can to understand that before we just start arguing from a viewpoint whether it's how dare you i'm not a racist or i'm the biggest racist ever and so are you and we both need to acknowledge that now right <laughs> it's how you, you need to there needs to be some gathering period so the work for me isn't arguing it's learning as much as possible. It's learning as much information as you can about COVID, about climate change, about racism, right? And just going back to that source. But then again, that's exhausting. Just that that effort of learning what you can, um, weighing it against what you thought you knew and the dissonance that creates in your brain, how uncomfortable you feel with the truths that you might learn there. It, that's an exhausting process. So you still have to go through these waves of learning and resting, learning and resting. Right. So and what I find the value of resting is for me is it's not necessarily a checkout, although I certainly have times where I just check out. Um, but what it does is it, it allows me to do something, I think, even before the obs allow observe and allow, which is to decide what's the outcome I'm going for, because in the moment, the outcome I'm going for is to win the fight. Mm. Right. But I mean, I, I remember you telling me a story once about like a, a bar fight that you prevented from happening. Mm. And I'm like, boy, if I were Glenn and I was as good at martial arts, I would just want to like dust it up once in a while. Just, to, sure. you know, yeah. and there was a part of me that wanted there was a part of me that really wanted to. Like, and, and he was like a really clearly <laughs> not a very nice person, like clearly like bigoted and awful. And I kind of wanted to teach him a lesson, but that wasn't the outcome. Right? That wasn't the outcome. You're right. Yeah. Right. So to be able to say, OK, so the, the outcome I want I want here is not to be right, not to be validated, mm. not to be approved of by the in crowd or the people who, mm. you know, I, I feel I'm inferior to in some way by virtue of history, whether ancestral or personal, my the outcome I want is increasing sanity, peace, understanding, love, because that's how humans solve problems. Like, yeah. like at that point, things don't have to look like a fight. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That seems to in much the way that one of my teachers um, in Russia, Mikhail Ryabko, once um, he shared a, a quote online this um, this last week, which was to the tune of, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like, where there is love, there can be no fear, right? That you have mm -hmm. to you have to come from a place of overwhelming love in order to hold fear at bay. You know, that mm -hmm. it's that you have to you have to fill that space with positive pressure um, in order not to allow the fear to get in. Right. You don't do it once. You, you do it over and over and over again. Right. You have to rekindle this power and this positivity in yourself to make yourself strong enough to hold the fear at bay. And, I, and it, it takes a takes an enormous amount of internal strength, I think, um, to be able to do that, 
to be able to hold yourself off. And, and what we're seeing is, um, and this is getting onto another topic, I, I don't think that modern North American society, at least, is set up in a way that it helps us to build that kind of strength, right? I, I think it's it's showing in much the same way that COVID and like um, and our, our response to it is showing that we were woefully unprepared in terms of warnings and infrastructure and communication and things, ways of dealing with this kind of thing, right? It's showing the the weak links in the chain that would mean if there was something Ebola like that hit us tomorrow, we would be done for, right? It's, right. <laughs> um, it would be absolutely done for. It's showing like how underprepared we are. I think that this is showing us the fact that we've ballooned into this cataclysm of criticism and emotional response as a whole society, right? For the most part reveals that we're on some fundamental level, not that strong and easily manipulated, right? That, that we need to work more on strengthening ourselves from the inside out in order to be more decent, more compassionate people, right? And that we have to cultivate that inner strength and positivity in order to hold ourselves against that when it happens, because it's going to happen, right? Um, and I, I don't think society is conducive to that, right? Whether you want to pin it on the meritocracy or you want to pin it, pin, pin it on the individualism that's so rife here, right? It's just, I've got mine, you've got yours. If I pull myself up by my bootstraps, then that proves how successful I am. And if somebody else is not as successful as me, it proves that they're just lazy or they didn't do the work or whatever it's going to be. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's something wrong fundamentally with that viewpoint, I think. Um, and I don't think I realized that until this point. But if you hold that alone without a sense of duty and responsibility and without a sense of empathy and humanity and concern for what's happening to everybody else, um, you can't have just rights and and trying to express and force them on other people without that counterbalancing of duty, responsibility and empathy and compassion. I, and I think that what we're seeing is that that's not cult cultivated very much <laughs> in yeah. our society. And some people have decried it like, you know, some people on the right will say that's because of a lack of religion. We don't have enough moral ethics anymore that come from religion. And so people have collapsed that way. Some people on the other end will say it's collapsed because of divisions and um, and, you know, worshipping of money and, and wealth over other things. Right. So there's different arguments for why we've got to that place. But it's clear that what we've got right now isn't quite working and that people like you and I are having to draw on other disciplines like draw on other traditions and draw on other ways of thinking about things in order to combat this deficiency yeah. this yeah. individual and societal that we can see right now yeah i guess you know the human being evolved in a communitarian environment yeah right, where it was it was easy to be a co contributing member of your tribe of 120 yeah, yeah. Right? and it's really hard to to be a contributing member of this society where i don't even know most people Sure. Uh, who, yeah. You know, who live on my street. Yeah. Um, you know, and precisely at this time when, when it feels that like we're so fractured, we yeah. have to socially distance because yeah. I because I know like the, the, the best thing for me is to is to be in the presence of other people who've done more work than I have. Yeah. Right? Like then I I entrain and I get on their vibrational level and I'm like, oh, OK, I remember who I am now. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we know that social media is not a neutral platform, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an engine for outrage and hate because that makes more money for for the advertisers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when we say take a rest, definitely take a rest from social media is included within that bracket. <laughs> I think regular periods of not doing it. I have I've, I, mean, I recommend this on my stress proof courses to people. I actually had to in include an entire extra piece on it um, relating to technology. I used to talk about the big and the big four of behavior change where people slip up with regard to stress, which is uh, diet, uh, sleep, movement, um, and then focus, right? And then I realized that um, focus is kind of split and it's so much of it is split due to technology and social media and internet enabled devices that it requires almost its own category. So now I've kind of got focus and connection as two separate things and now there's big five, right? Mm. <laughs> it's become such a huge thing. So that's, and the thing that I recommend and that I use myself is, it, it seems daft and you shouldn't have to use it, but I literally have a app blocking app on my phone that I subscribe, a lot, not screen time because you can sub, subvert it, you know, circumvent it too easily, all huh. that kind of stuff. But what I find, what I like about it is that it allows you to just set an entire time period during which you have no access to any of these things. And then it, it shares across all of your devices. So you can't just cheat and pick up an iPad or pick up a phone or pick up a laptop or something instead. 
and then it does it for a prescribed time period. So I'll often do it at nine in the morning and set it that it doesn't let off until 11 at night. And then mm. usually by the time it's 11 at night, I'm exhausted and I don't feel like looking at Facebook anyway, and I'll leave it alone, right? <laughs> and that kind of stuff, right? So by blocking yourself out for that period, then you're fine. And if you get to the weekend, you're like, no, I want to catch up with what friends and family are doing, see some photographs. You can allow yourself a bit longer or something. But if you can take that kind of slippery slope, but for some people, it's as simple as just you know, going back to a crappy flip phone or putting a phone in the bread bin all day or something, you know, <laughs> you have to go, you have to go cold turkey to get around it. But if you have to use it for work or something like that, or you need to check in with people to advertise things on Facebook, um, then I can, I, I think that kind of self-limiting constraint can be really, really helpful in enforcing rest, right? It's like setting aside a time to do meditation or setting aside a time for exercise. If you don't create the time in the space, you don't have that commitment device, you probably will falter right at some point during the day when you get stressed out. So I found that really, really helpful. Right. Now that time. Well, you know, uh, alcohol and cocaine don't get any smarter at keeping mm. you addicted. Mm. Right. But the Internet, Facebook does. Yeah, Google does. Yeah. So and and you know like I'm oh, well, it happens to other people, but not me. Like I'm too smart yeah. for that. Like, <laughs> yeah, crazy. That's a crazy yeah. thought. But one parting thought, I think, to go with, though, I think I, I've, you know, it's, it's very easy to go into a, a spiral on this again, um, which comes back to that kind of shame response of like, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? Should I be aggressive about the people that are telling me that I'm not doing too much? Um, and the tendency in the midst of all of that is just to kind of shrink and be like, well, it's kind of hopeless. I can't change systemic racism on my own. I can't change how quickly this country recovers from covid. I can't change how quickly the world recovers from climate change. And I, you know, I have very little agency in the world, right? It's easy to kind of sink into that belief and, and into apathy and into depression and, and fatigue and a lot of other things that come along with it physiologically, right? And that's not going to be helpful uh, in the long term. I, I think whether or not whether or not you believe it's going to happen very, very soon or whether you believe it's going to happen over, over a few torturous years or whatever it's going to be, there's no doubt that a lot of the things that we're seeing and questioning right now, they didn't just spring up with COVID, right? The, the, the brokenness of our healthcare system and our unpreparedness to deal with something like this has been something people have been warning about for decades. Um, the systemic racism and the problems of inequality in America have been something people have been talking about for centuries, right? So mm. it's, and climate change has been around at least since the 50s as a concept, right? And, and it's gone in and out of favor and it becomes more or less important to people depending on what else is going on in the news. But none of these issues sprung up out of nowhere. All that's happening is, is that we're reaching a kind of crucible, a, a kind of precipice. And, and I think there's a very real hope that forcing us to kind of look at this very, very closely and forcing us to do something about it in a short period of time has the hope of us coming out of this and into something else. I, I don't think the American experiment is over, right? It's, um, it's, we've found out a few things that didn't work, right? And, mm -hmm. and in the spirit of science, we have to sometimes change the goals and we have to change the way that we're looking at things and reframe the question. Um, we've, we've, you know, we've, validated a few null hypotheses here and it's time to try and look at a few new ones and then see what we can do to go forwards and i think we can do that in our own lives in a small way and i think there's a hope for it happening on a larger scale right i realize i've made this a little bit america centric and we might have listeners all over the world but i'm sure that other people are thinking similar things in some other places it's just it's just more desperate and immediate here at the moment so. right well Le leonard cohen said uh, he wrote a song called democracy and he said it's coming to america first the birthplace of the best and of the worst so, nice. so yeah. uh, I think we're, we we're we we tend to be uh, behind a lot of important curves, but also ahead of a lot of them, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what comes to me when you say that is, you know, like to, the pressure that I put on myself to save the world um, mm -hmm. is a, a, a podcast guest I had a while back. Charles Eisenstein talks about the dangers of thinking in scale, like like what I have. To, I have to you know, reach a million people. I have to start the next big startup. And, and he said, like, think about Nelson Mandela's grandmother who mm. essentially raised him to be the sort of person who could come out of jail after 27 years with love. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Start small and do what you can. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like <clears throat> we're talking about this next election, right? There'll be, there'll be about 100 million votes cast. There'll mm. be 100 million individual votes cast, hmm. right? Like the, the unit of change is, is individual. 
And, sure. and I think by by embody, by embodying the fighting spirit, like I'm going to fight for this and fight for that and fight fight against this and fight against that. I think we're we're um, perpetuating the same energy that mm. that caused one of the, many of the problems. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. So, Wise words, my uh, friend. Well, um, one question. Uh, what's the name of the app so I can put it in the show notes for people who want to take control of their tech life? Oh, yeah. The one I use is called Freedom. It's Freedom. great. Uh, you, yeah, you, I think you can subscribe monthly or you can get like a lifetime forever subscription for a, for less than 70 bucks. And I've, I swear by it. I think it's, I think it's phenomenal. And okay. you can also, um, for those with kids and stuff like that, you can uh, blanket your um, your spouse or your kids' phones and devices <laughs> all with one touch. You can go beep and put, uh, put it on different lists and things like that. So so it will make you the least popular person in the house, but you'll be doing the right thing. <laughs> cool. And also your stress-proof course. Tell, tell us a little about that. Yeah. It's, um, so this was um, a course that I was previously running as a three-day retreat uh, or a half-day workshop live and in person with people breathing on each other and pushing and pulling and touching and all kinds of wonderful things that we don't have the luxury of doing right now. Um, so it's been reimagined and recast as a 30-day online course. Um, so we're just in the process of kind of polishing off the first test cohort that have been through it and they seem to be enjoying themselves and getting some real benefits. So um, so by hopefully by the end of the month, that should be available for people to sign up for um, and they can find out about that at stressproof.net. Great. And do you have a uh, like an email catch sign up so that people don't have to remember to come back at the end of the month? Sure. Yeah. If they would just want to get kind of on the newsletter and get updates as to so that they can get on the waiting list for the first um, for the first real paying cohort of people that go through. Um, it's it's the same almost the same address as info at stressproof.net. OK, so I can just send you an email and they, that'll get them on the mailing list. Yeah, just a just info at stressproof.net and just say, hey, I'm interested in the stressproof course. And from there, I'll just put them on the on the constant contact list that um, I won't bug you with lots of emails because I don't have a lot of content. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just I'll just send you things when things are happening and you'll have the option of signing up or not. So Awesome. And that's anywhere in the world, right? It's not it's not a local thing. Yeah, it's a, it's anywhere in the world. There, there is a interactive aspect to it. We don't just set people. It's kind of like an online university course uh, where people have like a little bit of drip fed work to do every day. It's about five minutes, five to 10 minutes of reading and then five to 10 minutes of doing like um, videos, instructional things that you do physically to take control of your stress response. The idea is to kind of increase your knowledge of how stress happens, to increase your awareness of how stress manifests in your body and in your life in terms of behaviors um, and then to uh, apply controls and those control measures are through physical controls like uh, concrete things that you can do to gain control of your stress response in the moment and also long-term controls like habit fixes that nudge you towards being less stressed out anyway um, so it's the, the combination of the knowledge awareness and control come together in a in a trifactor of making you a lot more stress proof and that, that's the idea of it awesome and that's um, ba ba basically um you know how how to be how to self regulate is kind of the first res responsibility of an adult human. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the, it culminates in basically routines that you can apply every single day, and you custom you customize them and make them for yourself. So it's not um, prescriptive. I don't give you all these things you have to do every day. I give you a menu of things, and then you go away and you choose from the menu. Um, knowing that you have to have some sort of stress proofing meal today, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> some sort of work that you have to do, but you choose the meal, um, mm -hmm. and then. At the end of the course, it kind of ties everything together into a solid ability to self-regulate yourself. And then it also um, hints at the possibilities of being able to co-regulate other people as a result. So um, this can be really helpful for parents, for teachers, for managers, for anybody who has to deal with people on a daily basis, which is most of us, um, mm -hmm. who not only want to be more stress-proof themselves, but then want to kind of um, have that courage and strength become contagious and help other people to be stronger and, and less stressed in their lives too. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I've been waiting a long time for this, as you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm uh, excited about it. A, great. Yeah, so, one good thing about COVID, it, it drove me indoors and forced me to finish the damn course. So it's, <laughs> that's one good thing. I, I've written several books this way as well when I had no choice but to do something else. So, so there we go. Awesome. Well, and I, and I and I finished the Americans on Netflix. So, uh, <laughs> Hooray. so, so we, we both had a fruitful uh, quarantine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Glenn, Glenn Murphy of stressproof.net. Thank you, as always, for oh, thank you. Howie. It's always a pleasure to have you for all for all you do. Thank you, mate. Take care. Yeah, you too.